Let's come to God in prayer. Let's speak with him and ask for his blessing as we look at his word together. Heavenly Father, you are the one who has laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. And so we ask that you would send the Holy Spirit to us now so that we obey them through Christ's name. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, this morning we're taking a break from our series in the book of Philippians uh, to look at the book of Acts, particularly as we come to the baptism of Raoul today. And we're looking at this sermon that the Apostle Peter gives in Acts chapter 2. It is the day of Pentecost. Uh, the Holy Spirit has de descended with great power upon uh, the apostles and a great gathering of people has come around them trying to work out what is going on. And Peter has preached this uh, message that we've just read in Acts chapter 2 from verse 14 through to verse 41 and he has spoken about a number of things what is it that he has primarily spoken about though well it's Jesus of Nazareth he has spoken about Jesus of Nazareth the life death and resurrection of Jesus and we see that if you look with me at verse 22 of Acts chapter 2 Acts chapter 2 uh, verse 22 where we read men of Israel listen to this Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles wonders and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know so he's preaching about Jesus of Nazareth and Jesus is uh, as accredited by God by the miracles and wonders and signs so he preaches about uh, Christ's life Jesus's life but also his death we read in verse 23 this man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge and you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him to the cross so we see he's preaching about the life of Christ, he's preaching about the death of Christ, but not only that, he speaks of the resurrection of Jesus. Verse 24, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. The life of Christ is spoken about, the death of Christ is spoken about, but also the resurrection of Jesus Christ is spoken about. And we look at uh, in the rest of the sermon, if we were to look at it in detail, we'd see how it's supported by quotes from the Old Testament as the, the King David uh, prophesied many years ago about the fact that someone would be not see decay, that they would rise again. And then he doesn't just end there. What else does he do? How does he finish his sermon? Well, he speaks about the exaltation of the Lord Jesus. Verse 33, verse 33 of Acts chapter 2, exalted to the right hand of God. He has received, that's Jesus, from the Father, the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. The Lord Jesus, he has ascended and is now at God's right hand. He is in session. He has been exalted there. And now, as the Apostle Peter spoken about the life, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension and exaltation of Christ, how does he finish his sermon? How does Peter's sermon finish? Well, it's with the condemnation of the sin of the Jews. And we see that in verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. It's very clear to emphasize that they are responsible for the murder of the Lord Jesus Christ. And not only is it that he is just the man Jesus of Nazareth, but he emphasizes there, the Apostle Peter emphasizes that they have murdered their Messiah. They have murdered their Lord. There's a, there's a link there in verse 36 to the divinity of Christ. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. They're guilty of what we could name as deicide. The deity has been murdered, deicide, and they are guilty of this sin. And Peter goes on to warn them in many other ways about their sin, as we see uh, down in verse 40. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Peter has spoken about the Lord Jesus, but he's also spoken about the sin of the people. And he has emphasized to them that they are guilty of murdering their Messiah, of murdering their God. They're guilty of murder. And what's the response of the Jews to this revelation from the Apostle Peter? As they've gathered here on the day of Pentecost to work out what is going on, what, does Peter, uh, what is the response of the people? Well, we read in verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart they were cut to the heart and said to peter and the other apostles brothers what shall we do 
They were cut in heart. What does that mean? Well, it means that they were convicted of their sin. They're trying to work out what do we do as a result of the fact that we have sinned against God. We have sinned against the Messiah. Their hearts are pounding. This Greek word is a very unusual word that was translated there as cut to the heart. Uh, it only occurs once in the whole of the New Testament, but it was used by other Greek authors, of course, and one classical author used it for the, describing the pounding of horses' hooves on the ground. So you think of the heart and it's pounding. The people's hearts are pounding as they hear about their sin and the way they've treated their Messiah, who they've been longing for. I mean, David prophesied so many years before and they've been looking forward to, for this Messiah. And here they find out that they've actually gone and murdered him. And so their hearts are cut. They're convicted about their sin. And it's the description that you could read of what conviction of sin is in, in that psalm that we had read for us before. Conviction of sin is all through the Bible, and Psalm 38 is one very good example where it talks about God's arrows have pierced me, or I am troubled by my sin. That's what it means that they're cut in heart, that they're troubled by their sin, that they feel like arrows have pierced their hearts. And so what does Peter tell them to do as their response is a cry of what shall we do in the conviction of sin? What does he tell them to do? Verse 38, Peter replied, repent. Repent and be baptised every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. He tells them to repent. What is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind. A change of mind and a change of heart that instead of going one way and doing evil, now going to do what is right. A turn from unrighteousness to righteousness. And what else does he encourage them to do? Repent and be baptised. Why? Because baptism shows a change of mind, a submission into Christ's name. We read that. Be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. You were previously under your own banner, your own name. Now you have repented. You are going to be baptised, showing that you are in Christ's name now, that you are following his ways. You're going, his ways. you're going in his ways rather than in your ways. Now, why does he tell the people to repent and be baptised? Into the name of Christ Jesus? Well, it's so that they would have forgiveness of sins. Verse 38, uh, Peter replied, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. The people want to be forgiven of their sin, particularly in this context, the sin of murdering their Messiah. They want to be forgiven, and Peter tells them, the way to be forgiven is to repent. Repent and be baptised, submit to Christ. And if you do so, well, you'll be saved from your sin. And instead of eternal pain for your sin against God, you will have eternal joy and life. You even see a description of the joy that one has if they belong to God back in verse 28 in that quote from the Psalms. Verse 28 of Acts chapter 2. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Now, of course, Peter's quoting that psalm in reference to the Lord Jesus. But, of course, if we are in Christ Jesus, then this is a truth for us as well, that we, have the part, we will be in the paths of life if we repent, that we will be in God's presence and will be filled with joy accordingly. And so this is what we read happened on the day of Pentecost. Peter preaches about the life, death, resurrection, exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. He then points out the sin of those who have rejected Christ and then encourages them to repent and to be baptised for the forgiveness of sins and so that they will live eternally. But what about us? Is there any reference for us today? Well, if we are to have forgiveness of sins, we must go through the same process. We must go through the same process. What's the process? Well, firstly, we must hear the word of God. We must hear God's word. How do we hear God's word? Well, it's by reading God's word. It's by hearing God's word preached. It's by having another person tell us what God's word says about the Lord Jesus and about our sin, or by reading books. So many people have gone through this process by simply reading a book that explains God's word to them. Now, why do we need to look at God's word? Well, it's because God's word teaches us, God's word teaches us that we are murderers too. We are murderers too. Every sin that we commit, every time we break God's law, 
is a murder of God and of man. It's motivated by a desire for self rather than for God. We can't reject Jesus Christ and think it's okay. It's of no consequence. Every time we reject the Lord Jesus Christ, it's murder. Because we're basically saying to Jesus, you're dead to me. I don't want anything to do with you. People do this from time to time. They'll do it with parents. They'll do it with children. They'll say, you are dead to me. What's that mean? I don't want anything to do with you. I'm not going to consider you in my life. That's what you do when you reject Jesus Christ. And when you reject God and his laws, you're saying, you are dead to me. I don't want anything to do with you. It's a murder in your heart towards God. And when we hear that, then what happens? What's the process we go through? We hear God's word. We hear that we are murderers of God, that we've broken God's laws. We must then be cut to the heart, convicted in our hearts of the attempted murder that we have made against God. It is really attempted murder because you can't murder God. They tried to murder Jesus Christ. What happened? He came back to life. We can't murder God either. It's attempted murder. But we must be convicted of that so that we then repent. We then repent of the sin that we've committed of rejecting God and his ways, rejecting the Christ and his ways. So we hear, we must go through this process that we see here in Acts chapter 2. We too must go through this process. We hear God's word and then it must cut our hearts so that we then repent and start to live his way. You say, is there another way that we can be cut in heart? Is there another sword that cuts sinful hearts, bringing true conviction of sin and repentance? No, all other swords break on hard, sinful hearts. Sinful hearts are so hard that all other swords that are held up as a possibility to convict people of their sin, to make people feel guilty about the wrong they've committed. They all break. They do not bring true conviction of sin and true repentance. What other swords are proposed by people? Well, there's a sword of logic and reason. But it breaks in trying to convict sinful hearts. People try to reason what's right and wrong, reason it through with someone. And they, people say, if you just give kids a good education, they will be raised and they will be good people. If you lead them in right paths, and reason with them and show them logically that what they're doing is wrong and will not benefit others, then they will be convicted and they will move in a positive direction. They will repent of their wicked ways. But this doesn't convict truly and cause repentance. Why? Well, philosophers will give reasons why there's no right or wrong at all, let alone a deicide, let alone a murder of God. God doesn't even exist, philosophers will tell you. And so, you see, as people try to reason with someone, there's always excuses given as to why another branch of philosophy says that that is not actually wrong. You see this even with children. You try to reason things through with them and say, do you understand what you're doing? What happens with the sword? It just breaks. The heart does not break. The sword breaks. And they cannot be convicted of their sin and change their ways. What's another sword that's proposed that will break human hearts, convict them of sin, cut them to the core? Well, it's a sword of experience. That if you leave someone to meditate upon what they've done, they will be convicted of their sin. But no, the sort of experience of conscience, it breaks as it tries to cut human hearts. Why? Well, a nagging conscience can be drowned out with distractions. A nagging conscience may be there, but it can be drowned out. And it can be literally drowned in alcohol. Some people try to take substances to drown out that conscience and they have some success in it. And so it does not cut their hearts. They find that their conscience at times will commend something that's actually wrong and condemn something that's actually right. And later on in life, they change their minds. Our experience cannot cut our heart. What's another sword that's proposed that cuts human hearts, makes them do what is right? Well, it's a sort of tradition and culture. And you see this in certain cultures. The shame culture is very strong. They think that if we just shame someone enough, they will be convicted of heart and they will change. They will repent of their wicked ways. But no, what happens? The teenager who's ashamed by his parents, who's shamed, he thinks he knows better. And he doesn't care what the parents say. What will he do? He'll just move out of home. Get away from the shame culture that's in the house. Or people just move cultures. 
They find another group of people around them who will affirm them in their wicked ways. And so the, the culture of tradition, and the culture and tradition, which is held up as this sword by which people will reform from their wicked ways, it breaks on human hearts. It doesn't bring true conviction. It doesn't bring true repentance. So what is the only sword that will cut people's hearts, that will get through that hardness of heart, convincing people of sin and causing them to repent? It's only God's word. And we see that there on the day of Pentecost. It's God's word as they hear God's word preached, that they are convicted of heart. This fits with what we read in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That is what the word of God is. It's a sword that penetrates to the heart. But you may say, I've heard God's word, and I don't feel cut to the heart. I don't feel conviction of sin. I don't feel that I'm a murderer. I'm not guilty of attempted murder of God. Why aren't I convicted? Does God's word not work after all, you may say? Well, yes, the word is not enough to convict people of sin. It's not enough. What else is needed? The word must be then stabbed into the hard heart of man. So he cries out, what shall I do? What shall I do? The word is proclaimed in some way, whether it be preaching, whether it be reading, whether it be someone explaining it to you, you're reading about it in a book, it must then be plunged into the heart of someone. Now, who does the stabbing of heart? And that's what this word is, that cut there, it can mean stinging or stabbing. Who does the stabbing? We ourselves? Do we take the word of God and plunge it into our hearts so that we feel convicted of sin and repent? No, we're dead in sin. We can't pick up a sword and put it into our hearts when we're dead in our sins. And the voice of the verb here tells us that it has to be someone outside. Whenever you have a verb, a, a doing word, it's always in a voice, an active voice or a passive voice, showing that either the person is doing the action or it's being done to the person. And what do we read here in Acts chapter 2, verse 37? When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? This cutting to the heart, is it active by the people doing it, or is it done to them? The verse doesn't say, they cut their hearts, does it? That would be active voice. They would be cutting their own hearts with the word of God. That's not what it says. It says, they were cut to the heart. It is done to them. Someone outside them is cutting their hearts. It's passive voice here in the Greek text. So who is it that stabbed the hearts of the Jews so many years ago? So they cried out, what shall I do? It was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. We see the Holy Spirit mentioned at the beginning of the chapter as he comes on the day of Pentecost, but he's also mentioned here in verse 38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ and for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who picks up the word of God, stabs it into someone's heart, and then it's the Holy Spirit who grants repentance, the healing of the heart, so that they live for God. And we read this in... John chapter, John chapter 16. Turn with me to John chapter 16, where we see that Jesus himself teaches that it's the Holy Spirit who convicts people of sin. He uses the truth, he uses the word, but it's him that brings that conviction of sin. John chapter 16, verse 7. Go back with me to uh, the book before Acts. John chapter 16, reading from verse 7. Jesus says, but I tell you the truth, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counsellor, the paraclete, the, Lord, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, what will he do? He will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. There plainly taught by the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the Holy Spirit who convicts people of their sin. Without the Spirit, nobody is ever cut in their heart by God's word, and no one ever repents, therefore. 
It's only when the Holy Spirit picks up God's word and plunges it into the hearts of people that they're convicted. Why aren't people convicted of sin when they hear God's word then? It's the Holy Spirit isn't stabbing people's hearts. And I see this in my ministry, and you would see it in the way that if you're a Christian and you speak God's word to people, you tell them about the Lord Jesus, you tell them that they are sinners if they're rejecting Christ Jesus. And what happens? Some are convicted, some are not. I see this in my preaching. I can preach a sermon on the word of God. I lift up the sword of God's word. Someone will say, I don't feel a need to repent of anything. And another person says, I was convicted. I was sorrowing in my heart. And I am conscious of my sin. And I'm repenting even now of the sin that I'm conscious of. Why does one repent and the other does not? It's because the Spirit stabs one person in the heart and leaves the other person in their sin. He does not stab them. The Spirit causes one person to die to self and live for God and leaves the other person to live for self and to be dead towards God. And this is happening even now as I speak, as you're listening. As I've preached on Peter's sermon here about Jesus and about sin and our rebellion against God, I've been doing what we see there in Acts chapter 2. The sword has been lifted up this morning. It's been lifted up in your presence, unless, of course, you've been asleep or daydreaming. I can't see all your videos at home, so I don't quite know. But if you haven't been listening at all, well, then, of course, the sword hasn't been lifted up in your presence. But if you've been hearing me speak about the Lord Jesus, and hearing me speak about sin and the judgment that is to come, then the sword is lifted up. And what should we all feel? We should all feel cut to the heart and convicted once more of our sinfulness. Even as Christians, we should grieve over our sin as we hear again about what rejection of sin actually means. That it means that you're saying to God, you're dead to me. The sins that we've committed this morning, this last week, that we've become increasingly conscious of as we've been hearing God's word, or a lifetime that we've had of deicide, committing murder against the deity of this world. We should be convicted of our sin once more and once again recognise that we deserve punishment. And what should we do? Well, we should repent and say anew. We should feel as we look at God's word and think, yes, rejection of the Messiah is so awful. Even my rejection this last week as I've sinned, as I've broken his law, in that moment I've been a practical atheist. I've been rejecting Christ Jesus. And so I repent and say anew, I believe in Christ Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. Repentance is an ongoing thing for the, the Christian. It's not as though we repent at the beginning of our life and then that's it. No, as we become conscious of each sin, we once more shall be convicted of sin as we read God's word and come once more in repentance to him, saying, I'm going to go your way, God. I'm going to try as hard as I can to put that sin to death. And then what happens? Well, there should be a rejoicing that comes after our repentance, knowing that we have forgiveness of sins, that we have been forgiven in Christ Jesus, and we are in God's presence, and we can be filled with joy even now, as we read in Acts chapter 2 with that quote from the Psalms. You have made known to me the paths of life, verse 26, uh, 28. You will fill me with joy in your presence. That should be happening to us now. We should be going through this process, all of us, including myself up the front here, as we look at God's word. We feel once more the, the horror of sin. We should feel convicted. We should once more say, I repent. But I now rejoice knowing that through repentance I am forgiven through the death of Christ Jesus. Has that happened to you this morning? Have you been convicted of your sin by God's word on your hard heart? Not a false conviction that's brought from reason or a nagging conscience or nagging parents, but that true conviction that leads you to cry, what shall I do? And end in repentance by flinging yourself upon Christ Jesus. Now, if you've never known conviction of sin in your life, if you've never felt a pounding on your heart, a stabbing in your heart, a stinging of your heart about your sin, what does that mean? Well, you're still guilty of deicide. You're still guilty of murder of God. You're unforgiven and you're on your way to hell, to eternal punishment in hell. 
Yes, the sword of God's word hovers over your heart right now as you listen to me speak, but it doesn't go in if you're not convicted of sin. Why? Because the spirit doesn't stab your heart and then doesn't apply repentance for the healing of your sin. So I plead with you now, if that is the case, if you've never, ever felt conviction of sin, beg God to cut your heart now so that you do repent and so that you do have eternal life. That's what Peter did so many years ago. Verse 40, with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. If you've never felt conviction of sin, I plead with you now, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Yes, there's many other people out there who've never felt convicted of their sin either. Save yourself from this corrupt generation. Come to God. Beg him to cut your heart and then repent. Repent. Submit to Jesus Christ. If you don't repent in this life, you won't repent in the next. Repentance is a gift. There's no promise that repentance will be granted to people in, the, in hell. You will think murderous thoughts of God for eternity in hell if you do not repent in this life. If you do not repent now, today is the day of salvation. This period we live in now is a time of salvation. If you will come to God in repentance, you'll be forgiven of your sins and know the fullness of joy that comes of living in God's presence. And then what? Well, be baptised. Be baptised in Christ's name. Why? Not to be saved, but because you are already saved from sin and from death, the judgment that is to come, the eternal sufferings of hell, be baptised to show that you have true repentance in your heart as you publicly declare that you are submitting to Christ Jesus. You're being baptised into Christ's name. And then what? Well, join with God's people in joyfully conquering sin over the rest of your life. How? Was well, by doing what we're doing this morning. Christians, again, hearing God's word, being convicted of sin, repenting of sin, and then joyfully accepting the forgiveness that God gives, joyfully rejoicing in that forgiveness that God gives, singing Wesley's hymn, which we'll sing in a moment together. No condemnation now I dread, Jesus and all in him is mine, alive in him my living head and clothed in righteousness divine. That's what Wesley sung many years ago. No condemnation now I dread, Jesus and all in him is mine, alive in him my living head and clothed in righteousness divine. That is you if you are convicted of your sin and turn to God in repentance. And then how does that verse of Wesley's end? Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. That's what we're looking forward to as Christians. We're looking forward to that time where we will boldly approach the eternal throne and claim the crown crown through Christ my own. So follow in the steps of Peter. I encourage you all. Follow in the steps of Peter and the Jews and myself and Raul today. Raul is being baptised today. Why? Because the experience that we read here in Acts chapter 2 is his experience. Raul has heard the gospel about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's heard the word of God. Raul has experienced the Holy Spirit stabbing his heart with the word of God. Raul has then asked, what shall I do as he's been convicted of sin? And he has heard the call to repent. And what has he done? He has repented. He's turned from rejecting Christ, from rejecting God and his ways, to accepting God and his ways. And so Raul today is publicly declaring that by being baptised into Christ's name to affirm solemnly that he is a sinner saved by God's grace. And Raul has been joyfully conquering sin by hearing God's word with conviction and repentance. And so today is a day of rejoicing for Raul. He knows what verse 28 says is true for him, that God has made known to him the paths of life, and God has filled him with joy in God's presence. And it's a day of rejoicing for all God's people as we rejoice with Raul. This is why I love being a Baptist. We rejoice in every baptism in a way that those who do what's called pedo baptism which isn't really baptism at all. They can't do, because they don't know what the infant's going to do with its life. They don't know where the infant's going to be for all of eternity. We know where Raul's going to be for eternity. 
he's going to be in the presence of the Lord with fullness of joy along with the rest of us. And so this is a day of rejoicing as we see him affirm what God's grace has done in his life, what the Holy Spirit has done for him, that the Holy Spirit didn't pass over him and leave his heart unstabbed. But the Holy Spirit said, Raul, I'm stabbing you in the heart. I'm going to bring conviction of sin. It's going to be painful, but I'm also going to bring repentance and I'm going to bring joy and forgiveness of sins to your life. We all deserve hell for our sin. We all deserve hell for our sin. But we, many of us here, are in forgiveness of sins, awaiting our transport, awaiting our transport to Christ's presence, our journey to Christ's presence. Raul will receive eternal life in Christ's presence. He will rejoice for all of eternity, and many of us listening now will rejoice with Raul. But will you, will you, that's the question for you to ask, will you be rejoicing with Raul for eternity? Let's come to God in prayer. Let's speak with him. Heavenly Father, we praise you as the God who powerfully speaks and convicts men of sin by the Holy Spirit. Thank you for stabbing many of us in the heart with your word so that we have repented of our sin, of rejecting you and your ways. Oh Lord, we thank you for granting us forgiveness of sins and eternal life through that repentance that you have brought in our hearts and our minds. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to keep on listening and being convicted by your word and repenting as we look forward to the fullness of joy in your presence in heaven. And Lord, if there are any listening now who have never felt conviction of sin, they've never repented of their sin, oh Lord, send your Holy Spirit to them now. Do not pass over them. Send your Spirit. Convict them of sin. Bring repentance to their minds and their hearts so that today may be the day of their salvation. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.